Well, it's a huge honor to be speaking here at the 100 year uh, birthday anniversary of material science and engineering. I didn't know how to follow um, Bill Nix's talk. Uh, what a great way um, to kick off uh, you know, the, the centennial celebration. I figured the only way I could follow him was by opening with a Hollywood hit. Um, and since I've been watching a lot of kid movies lately, I opened up with um, Inside Out. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, it's an animation put out by Pixar where the characters personify emotions like joy and happiness and frustration. And my lab is certainly no stranger to those emotions. Um, but more importantly, uh, what this movie does is uh, they have characters that personify emotions to give us a glimpse into perhaps one of the most um, complex dynamic systems that you can imagine, namely a child's mind. And that kind of underpins a lot of my lab's interest trying to develop characterization techniques that allow us to peer into complex dynamic systems. But before I get into the technical aspects of my talk, I just want to share with you some pictures that I've had from my 10 years here at Stanford. Um, actually, it'll be 10 years in March. It's hard to believe it's gone by so quickly, um, but I can say with the material science department, it's been such an honor to um, learn from you and to grow with you and do research here. Um, we've shared many events together from celebrating big games to celebrating um, graduations. Uh, I've had a chance to uh, celebrate weddings with many students and colleagues. Um, we've also gone out to really nice dinners, usually on the department's dime to celebrate <laughs> tenure or for faculty searches. Um, and then I've also had the chance to travel the world, not only for my own research, but as a department. Our department shares many international conferences. And I remember in my third year here, Bob Sinclair organized a meeting where we all got to go to um, Sweden um, to have uh, essentially a big faculty retreat there. And that was uh, one of the fondest memories I had in my first few years here as a professor. So in aggregate, looking at all of the pictures from my 10 years here, I found that they've kind of painted a picture of who we are as a department, our role in the community, and where we might be headed. And I spent a few hours of yesterday preparing for this talk by making this photo mosaic. Um, so these are all the pictures that I've collected from my time here um, at Stanford. So uh, when we move to the molecular and nanoscale, we unfortunately can't just zoom in to get a higher resolution image of what we are. Instead, we have to rely on essentially computer animations, many of which are derived accurately from the science, but there's no way of directly visualizing what's happening at the subcellular and molecular scale. And much of my research has focused on trying to develop techniques to give us a high resolution glimpse of, di glimpse of dynamic processes, spanning energy and health, and today I just want to give you a vignette of two um, particular applications. I'll dive a little bit into the science for how we do it. One of which is looking at um, ion intercalation in nanoparticles. It's the same sort of process that's occurring in your batteries, except that we look at a model system, hydrogenation of palladium. And this helps to inform improved energy storage devices and also photocatalysts for next generation sustainability. And then I'll also share with you how we can visualize um, forces that are going on between cells. And one interest area that I'm especially excited about is understanding the forces between an immune cell and a pathogen to help develop better immunotherapies. So starting off with how we make this uh, movie, first of all, on the left-hand side, and why we even were inspired to make those movies. Um, since we're at a Stanford centennial I, wanted, centennial, I wanted to include two electron micrographs from Stanford faculty. The one on the left is actually from Will Chu's lab, who's done a lot of really pioneering work, pioneering work on diffraction of um, battery materials and energy storage materials. And the one on the right is from Matt Kanan's lab over in chemistry, who's done a lot of really great work on photocatalysts. So if you peer into the active material, whether in a battery or in a photocatalyst, you can see that the active material is nanostructured. So the scale bar in each of these cases is on the micron scale, and many of the active materials have dimensions that are submicron or, or nanometers. And that's because empirically it's been found that these nanostructured materials offer you faster kinetics, also increased capacity for energy storage or increased product yield for catalysis. And that's likely because of the higher surface area to volume ratio. So if you have reactions that are occurring on the surface or ions that need to intercalate in, if you have a higher surface area, then you can more um, 
quickly either expedite reactions or get ions into the active material. And then it's also been found that these nanomaterials have extended lifetimes or you can cycle them many more times, either because the nanomaterials are more resilient to defects or if some of the nanomaterials are breaking, some of the other nanomaterials are still surviving. And I really like these images, um, but when I started as a faculty member, um, what struck me is just how polydispersed the active materials were. And what my lab and I wondered are which particles are best? Is there a particular morphology that might give us improved energy performance or photocatalysis? So how is it that the local particle structure affects its chemical function? And then especially in photocatalysis, how is it that illumination is either changing the chemistry or expediting the chemistry? So what we've done is kind of taken a single particle approach where we've tried to develop techniques that allow us to um, visualize these dynamic processes, whether photocatalysis or ion intercalation, with extremely high resolution. And as Alberto pointed to in his presentation this morning, I was lucky enough to join a really fantastic community of electron microscopists spearheaded by Bob Sinclair, who you noticed was on the title slide. When I first joined Stanford, the Titan Environmental Transmission Electron Microscope was just being installed. And what we've done is um, capitalize on a lot of the spectroscopies and approaches that are already in place um, in the TEM but also modify it with additional capabilities, in particular the addition to couple light into and out of the transmission electron microscope. So we partnered with Gatan a few years ago um, to develop the Vulcan holder, where we can take our electron transparent sample that's in the transmission electron microscope and then surround it by two parabolic mirrors. And the holder actually has two fiber optical inputs or outputs, so that way you can either do illumination or detection or dual illumination and detection um, of your materials. And one of the major challenges, I think, in developing some of these techniques for doing combined optical and electron microscopy is that, as many of you know, there's not a lot of space to work with. There's only a five millimeter pole piece gap. So these are, in a way, uh, kind of multi-micron sized optics that we're dealing with in order to be able to do some of these experiments. Um, and I also have pictures of some of my group members down here, both um, present and former, you'll get a chance to meet many of them at the poster sessions um, to learn uh, about some of the ongoing work in our lab. So as a model system, when we wanted to benchmark this technique, um, we wanted to look at photocatalysis, and we figured we'd start off by looking at the hydrogenation of palladium, in part because it's one of the oldest material science systems that's understood with phase transformations and phase diagrams dating all the way back to the 1800s. So in bulk, it's an extremely well understood phase transformation. There's less known about how not nanomaterials transform, but it turns out the system is actually isomorphic to a lot of the photocatalytic and energy storage devices that you would enjoy today. So what happens is you have your palladium uh, nanomaterial in a hydrogen rich environment, hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen gas pretty much autocatalytically splits into hydrogen at the surface. And then it starts intercalating into the nanoparticle sitting at those interstitial FCC sites. And when you're at sufficiently high hydrogen gas pressures, there winds up being a phase change from the hydrogen poor alpha phase to the hydrogen rich alpha phase. And hydrogen ions are misfitting spheres in those interstitial sites. So when you undergo a phase change, you actually have a pretty big lattice expansion. It's about 3.5% in lattice constant or close to about 10% in volume. So what I like about this transformation is there are a lot of different reactions occurring. There's the surface reaction, there's what's happening as a hydrogen starts intercalating, and then there's a phase transformation. So with those three different processes occurring, we have a suite of techniques that we can develop in the TEM to be able to follow these different reactions. So what we do is we synthesize nanoparticles and then we put them on an electron transparent substrate, usually silicon dioxide, sometimes silicon nitride, and then because we have the environmental TEM, we can flow in different gases, and then we can monitor the reaction with a combination of electron spectroscopy and optical spectroscopy. So here I mentioned that there is a 3.5% change in lattice constant, so diffraction of, is, of course, a very good way of looking at things. And also, if we look at the electron spectra or the optical spectra, you can see as you go from the alpha phase to the beta phase, here I've overlapped the two spectra, there's about a two electron volt shift in the bulk plasmon resonance. So we can use that large spectral change to follow locally what the phase is. 
So our, as our first set of measurements, we just kept everything in the dark and we want to know what's happening in thermodynamic equilibrium. So what we did is we set the hydrogen pressure to a certain value and then we used a combination of diffraction and eels. They both give commensurate results to figure out what phase the nanoparticle is in. And here I'm just showing you examples of five individual single crystalline nanocubes, five individual single crystalline nanoprisms, and then polycrystalline uh, or multiply twinned icosahedral nanoparticles. And you can see that the thermodynamic properties are quite distinct. So the single crystalline nanoparticles at the top exhibit very sharp phase transitions from the alpha phase to the beta phase, whereas the polycrystalline nanomaterials, namely the icosahedra, have this more gradual transition from the alpha phase to the beta phase. So to figure out what's going on, we developed techniques to essentially flash freeze the sample. So we introduced hydrogen and then we used techniques from cryo-electron microscopy, which won the Nobel Prize last year, to essentially trap hydrogen in the system so we can see what things look like in thermodynamic equilibrium. And here I'm just showing you two example pressures of the single crystalline nanocube. At low pressures, the system's entirely in the alpha phase, whereas at higher hydrogen pressures, the system is um, entirely in the beta phase. And regardless of what pressure we're at, when we're in equilibrium, we only find one phase. That's also the case for these single crystalline nanoprisms. Again, in equilibrium, just one phase. But when we reconstruct three-dimensional images of what the icosahedral nanoparticle is doing, you can see that there are different crystallites making up this nanoparticle, essentially uh, uh, kind of prisms, um, 20 tetrahedra that make up the icosahedral nanoparticle. And in equilibrium, each of those tetrahedra is transforming or is changing phase at a different pressure. This is something that I call mosaic loading, and it essentially gives rise to a reduced energy storage or hydrogen storage capacity for these polycrystalline nanoparticles. Okay, so all of that is in equilibrium, essentially showing that if you wanna maximize energy storage, these single crystalline nanoparticles are best. But what happens when we look at kinetics, or what um, happens dynamically? So here again, we can rely on contrast both in the electron spectra and the diffraction spectra, and you'll notice that part of the cube is turning white. That's where hydrogen is intercalating first from the corners of the nanoparticle. Then you notice it kind of wets the surface and eventually forms a 1OO type interface. I'll show you some snapshots of that video so you can see the hydrogen coming in from the corner, wetting the surface, eventually stabilizing in one particular direction, the 1OO direction, and then ultimately pushes the unhydrogenated phase out of the nanoparticle. And I mentioned that there's a lattice um, constant mismatch between both of the phases. So you can um, see that as the alpha phase is uh, being pushed out of the nanoparticle, when you look at the diffraction pattern, we wind up having two peaks, namely the alpha peak and the beta peak that form. And for those of you who recall your um, diffraction uh, classes, as a diffraction peak full width half max is increasing, there are essentially lattice imperfections that are being formed and that comes from the lattice mismatch between both of the phases. So even though we have um, uh, two phases coexisting, there are various lattice imperfections and defects that are forming, but intriguingly, at the end of the transformation, you'll see that the full width half max of the diffraction peak has tightened up again. And in fact, when the transformation is complete, this single crystalline nanoparticle goes back to being a single crystal, and in fact, a better single crystal than how it started off. So this only happens in a certain size regime of nanoparticles, but it shows that nanoparticles have this self-healing ability, which helped to explain the extended cyclability of these nanostructured um, devices or electrodes. But we can use this as a design principle to des uh, make even better energy storage uh, materials or photocatalysts. Okay, so beyond just, uh, you know, uh, single crystalline nanoparticles, we can also look at a variety of other shapes. And regardless of the shape or the polycrystallinity of the nanoparticle, we always have loading from the corners or these low coordination number sites. So how is it that we can potentially modify where reactions are occurring and make more of the catalyst um, area? So that's where illumination comes in. Like I said, we have um, the setup where we surround our sample by two parabolic mirrors. We're going to use the same palladium nanoparticle system, except that palladium on its own isn't a particularly good light absorber at optical frequency, so we decorate it with gold nanodisks to enhance the amount of light that it's absorbing. So here's an antenna reactor pair. 
Um, this is actually a design inspired by uh, Dane Sawyer, who's now a postdoc in my lab. So we have the gold disc that helps to absorb light and it transfers some of that light energy to the palladium nanocube. And then what we do is we set the pressure just below, or the um, pressure just above the desorption pressure, and then turn the light on. So here I'll just play with you uh, a diffraction uh, movie. So the light was on at the very beginning, and you can see the diffraction pattern expands, meaning the lattice is contracting, so we're going from the beta phase to the alpha phase. And if we again zoom in um, to the diffraction patterns, you'll notice that there are actually two different time scales that govern this photocatalytic transfer, um, transformation. We turn the light on. There was a period that you saw in that diffraction movie where really nothing was happening. So we call that the induction time. And then we wound up having phase coexistence between the alpha and beta phases. And when we started that phase coexistence all the way through to the um, end of the transformation, we call that the reaction time. So how do these times vary as a function of illumination wavelength? Well, if you look at the induction time shown in blue, you'll notice that generally it takes tens or hundreds of seconds for the transformation to occur in the dark. When we turn the light on, um, it also takes about that long unless we're at two very particular wavelengths where then we can expedite the kinetics by about 10x. So we actually expedite the induction time um, to only take on the order of a few seconds when we're at two wavelengths that correspond to the resonances, the electromagnetic resonances of this antenna reactor pair. But you'll notice that the reaction time is relatively constant, and that's because the reaction time depends upon the diffusion of hydrogen in the lattice. So this ability to directly visualize what the photocatalyst is doing actually told us that there are two time steps that govern the transformation, and that would have been something very challenging to observe in an ensemble measurement or without this ability to directly visualize um, the chemistry occurring at the nanoscale. So in addition to the diffraction movie, I just wanted to show you some time snapshots of what's occurring in the light versus in the dark. So you'll see in the dark that we have um, dehydrogenation occurring from the corners of the cube, just like we had hydrogenation occurring from the corners of the cube. Whereas upon illumination, we wind up getting usually dehydrogenation from the corners, sometimes from the edges, but across 25 antenna reactor pairs, more than 75% have the reaction occurring near this electromagnetic hotspot. So I said that we have those um, 10x expedited kinetics um, when we're on the resonance. Here's a calculation of what that resonance looks like. You can see that the local electromagnetic field is very strongly enhanced in the gap between the gold antenna and the palladium reactor. And that's actually where we can better populate some of those palladium hydrogen orbitals in order to expedite the dissociation kinetics. So this points to the fact that we can get sp site-specific catalysis, but like I said, what we really wanted to do is make more of the catalyst area active. And these measurements kind of pointed to a design principle, which is namely that we want to have an electromagnetic hotspot that spans almost the entire catalyst area. So as a proof of concept, we designed this material where we have, or this catalyst structure, we have a gold nanobar, and then we put just about two or three nanometers of silicon dioxide on top of it, and then we put our palladium nanorods on top. And you can see from the um, side view calculations of the local electromagnetic field that it's strongly enhanced in the gap between the gold nanobar and the palladium nanorod. Now you could imagine this would just be an entire gold film, except that it would make the movie a little bit less exciting. So these palladium nanorods um, always hydrogenate and dehydrogenate from the tips. So you can imagine that leaves a lot of the catalyst area unused. But what we found is that when we turn the light on, so here I'm just showing you a video. I'll turn the light on. I think it happens right around here. That you can see the hydrogen's going away now from the middle of the nanorod. And then when we turn the light off, which I think you'll see here at about 27 seconds, the hydrogen now comes in from the tips of the nanorod. So I think this is a pretty exciting opportunity to be able to engineer photocatalysts where we can make more of the surface area active and use more of the material, ultimately to increase reaction rates. So where is this work headed in the characterization realm? Well, we're um, moving beyond just simple gas phase reactions and looking to photocatalysis in liquid in order to, say, look at water splitting reactions or other aqueous environments. We're also trying to do atomic scale characterization of um, quantum emitters, 
So there are a lot of really efficient um, solid state room temperature quantum emitters. Um, but people don't understand yet what the atomic scale structure is, and we need to know that to control where the emission is occurring. So we're able to use a related technique to address those questions. Um, and then in the final area, we're applying some techniques that combine optical excitation and detection in a cryo-EM to basically construct a cell atlas, to, so to know where proteins are located on the surface of a cell. And I'll recommend that you go see our poster to learn more about those areas. So in the last eight or so minutes I have, I want to transition from a characterization technique to a materials development technique. And I'm going to focus in particular on uh, developing ways to quantify mechanical forces. So we experience mechanical forces every time our heart beats or a wound heals or, or we're listening. Um, and yet it's very hard to quantify um, those mechanical forces. I'm giving you here a few other examples of mechanical forces in nature. So it's known that um, stem cell differentiation um, can depend upon the nature of the local force that's exerted on it. If you put a stem cell on a substrate that is stiffer, um, kind of like bone, the stem cell tends to differentiate into bone. Whereas if you put the stem cell on a substrate that's more like jello, it'll differentiate into a fat cell. Um, also, an area which my lab is very excited about is um, understanding immune cell pathogen interactions. So every time you're fighting off an infection, an immune cell will basically seek out the pathogen cell, whether it's a bacteria or a virus or a cancer cell, and essentially form uh, a cell-cell contact that can last for multiple hours. Um, and the immune cell tries to rip open pores in the pathogen cell so that way it can send in cytotoxic chemicals that essentially target the pathogen for death. And it's thought that those immune um, synapse or immune cell pathogen forces can be on the order of about 100 nanonewtons, but no one's been able to directly visualize them to inform how different immune systems might be responding um, to different pathogens. And then if you go visit me in my office, I have a lot of plants. Um, they're often not watered well just because of the um, travel schedule I have, but turgor pressure in plants also is on the order of megapascals. So what are the uh, various techniques that we might use to characterize forces? Well, there are a number of techniques that are kind of um, ex situ, like atomic force microscopy, a pretty amazing technique actually for quantifying forces down to the piconewton level, but it's not something you could really do in vivo or to understand what's happening within an organism or between cells. Same with oil droplets or optical tweezers. Those are generally multi-micron size characterization techniques. So if we want to get down to the point where we can probe what's happening in vivo, generally we're in the realm of optical sensors, um, for example, uh, quantum dots or uh, forcer resonant based um, dyes like fret tethers. But many of these smaller sub 20 nanometer structures contend with tissue autofluorescence, so you usually excite them in the ultraviolet where many of our proteins also autofluoresce. And then generally, they suffer from photo bleaching. So after a while, the dye tends to degrade, and you can't do measurements for a very long time. So my lab has been developing these upconverting materials that instead of absorbing in the ultraviolet, where many of our proteins also absorb, they absorb in the infrared. And depending upon how you engineer the materials, you can get emission pretty much across the entire visible spectrum. So it's a multi-photon process, a two-photon process. Um, but it relies on real states rather than virtual states, so it can be rather efficient. And then um, here is uh, kind of the infamous uh, splayed out rat. Um, this is not from our lab, but I think it's a nice way of illustrating that even though the efficiency does not rival that of some of the best quantum dots, you can still do very good in vivo um, imaging because you don't have the autofluorescence. So the top image combines what you would see with a quantum dot within the tissue of um, a mouse or a rat whereas the bottom image shows you what you can get with some of these upconverting nanoparticles by virtue of getting rid of that background noise. Okay, so how can we make these sensitive to force? Well, most of the upconverters that we rely on and, and that tend to be quite efficient come from the F block of the periodic table. Um, for example, the lanthanides like erbium or ytterbium or thulium. And when you start making these nanomaterials, the starting salts that you have are generally a very pale color, like a pale pinkish color or pale reddish color. And that's because those F electrons are very um, close to the nucleus, so they're really well shielded from their environment. 
But if you go back to your MATSAI 202 class, um, you know that D metals, in contrast, are very sensitive to the surrounding crystal field or ligand field. So D electron orbitals um, can change their energies in response to, say, an octahedral crystal field or a tetrahedral crystal field, um, or based on the ligands that are binding to the D metal. So here, for example, are the same um, oxygen-based and uh, chlorine-based salts that we had, but replacing the erbium now with chromium. And you can see there's a very distinct color change. Um, and then, of course, ruby, some of you may have uh, worked with ruby before, is alumina with chromium impurities. So our idea was to combine the upconversion properties of the lanthanides with the sensitivity to the surrounding crystal field or the surrounding environment of D metals. So we take um, ytterbium and erbium, which absorb in the uh, near infrared, in this case at 980 nanometers, and then erbium emits in the visible um, frequency regime, usually in the red and green. And then we have a D-metal sensor that's very sensitive to the surrounding pressure. And the idea is that you can turn on and off the energy transfer between the erbium and the manganese. And all of these are then doped into a host lattice, um, usually a sodium yttrium fluoride host lattice, although if you go to our poster, you can see some new host materials that we're working with at this point. So we dope all of these ions into a ceramic host lattice that's biocompatible, and then we make nanoparticles that are sub-20 nanometers in size. We characterize their force sensitivity um, by using atomic force microscopy and also uh, diamond anvil cells. So some of you may have done um, this technique before. We essentially have two diamonds that we use to press on our nanoparticles. The diamonds are transparent, so it gives us optical access to the nanomaterials, and then we can characterize their upconversion emission. And you can see as we go from high pressure to low pressure, there's a pretty significant change in the spectral response. So this is the upconversion intensity. You can see there are peaks right around 520 or so nanometers and 550 nanometers, that's in the green, and then there are peaks in the red. And basically that ratio metric change, so looking at the red to green ratio, gives us a readout of what the force is. So here we're looking at the red to green ratio change. You can see it's linear with compression um, and with release. Um, and it gives rise to, in this case, a yellow to orange color change. We can kind of tune the color change that we want based upon the forces that we think will be exerted by the system. So to deploy these in biological systems, um, kind of going back to Bill Nix's uh, mention of not just engineering of materials, but also engineering with materials, what we do is we um, take these nanomaterials that we usually synthesize in organic solvents, we strip the ligands off of them so that way we can disperse them in water, a more biocompatible material, or other buffers, um, and then we feed them to uh, C. elegans. So this was one of our first biological measurements. C. elegans is a small worm. It actually likes to eat bacteria, so it likes to eat E. coli, and we just sprinkle the nanoparticles on top of E. coli, kind of like M&Ms, um, and then the worm uh, eats the E. coli plus the sprinkles on top, and here you can see um, the nanoparticles uh, within the worm, and I'll just show you a three-dimensional uh, confocal image of uh, the nanoparticles in part of the digestive tract. So as um, the worm starts to eat uh, the nanoparticles, first the nanoparticles and E. coli get chewed up in the grinder, that's kind of the teeth of the worm, and then they get swallowed right near the pharyngeal intestinal valve, and then they go through the digestive tract. So we can follow this whole series of um, ingestion and digestion uh, using our nanoparticles, where essentially the color of the nanoparticle inside the worm tells us about a measure of forces inside. And one reason why this is a convenient uh, model system to start with is that the worm undergoes um, rhythmic cycles of digestion every 45 seconds. Um, so you wind up getting the food, eating and excreting its food very frequently, so we have a lot of chance to do a lot of control measurements. And also, amazingly, something like 83% of our genes are homologous or are shared with that of the worm. So we actually have kind of a close cousin in this worm, so then we can start doing genetic mutations to understand how um, mechanical force relates to electrical signaling and various diseases. So first, we just wanted to make sure that the worms remained healthy after eating our nanoparticles. So um, here's just, again, some images of the nanoparticles within the worm, pre-feeding and post-feeding. The nanoparticles almost look better after eating. It's as if the nanoparticles got chewed up and spit out, and uh, the worm, in the meantime, uh, 
coated it with its saliva and made them look a little better. Um, <clears throat> so we did some uh, cytotoxicity tests, basically looking at um, a chronic brood assay just to make sure that the worms were still happily laying their eggs. That turns out to be one of the best toxicity tests. And what you can see is that without nanoparticles versus with nanoparticles, the results are very similar. So the worms still live to be as old as they naturally would, whether they ate the nanoparticles over that entire multi-day span, or if they didn't, and they also laid the same number of eggs, and those eggs also went on to live happily ever after. Okay, so now we look at spectra. Um, here are uh, spectra of nanoparticles right in the pharyngeal intestinal valve, so that's right where the worm is swallowing the nanoparticles versus in the grinder. So you can see the red to green ratio is different, whether it's in the grinder or in the pharyngeal intestinal valve. And both of those have uh, smaller red to green ratios than what you would find in ambient. And you can back that um, or correlate that to our um, ex situ force measurements, indicating that there are roughly 10 micronewton forces within the grinder and about one to um, 10, or rather one to two micronewton forces in the valve. And then in addition to static images, we can also look dynamically at the force. So here the um, color that you're seeing actually corresponds to um, the force being exerted by the worm as it's excreting the food. And we can see that the red to green ratio changes with um, approximately a 30 to 40 second um, periodicity that corresponds to um, a posterior body contraction or PBOC, um, relaxation, and then expulsion. So quite similar to the digestive system that we would experience as humans. So final slides, I just want to share with you some upcoming work. Um, we've been able to hook up the worms now to um, kind of like an EEG, an electropharyanogram, so that way we can understand the connection between neural activity and force exertion, um, kind of with the ultimate aim of using these optical sensors to see how electrical signaling and mechanical signaling are intertwined. And then, like I said, our most recent work that um, is not quite ready for prime time, but definitely by the next centennial will be ready, um, is increasing the sensitivity. So those nanoparticles were sensitive to the micronewton range. We're pushing that now to the nanonewton range so that way we can look at some of these uh, immune cell pathogen interactions, which we just started. And again, you can go to our poster for more information. So to summarize, uh, borrowing from Pixar's Inside Out, um, unload the daydreams, I've ordered extra. Um, I think it's pretty amazing what materials characterization and new materials development are doing for um, technology. Hopefully I've shared with you at least two um, vignettes of um, how material science approaches are helping to bring um, the inside out and address, I think, some key challenges in sustainability and in energy. I spent the first part of my presentation focusing on uh, kind of nanoparticle phase transformations and photocatalysis and showing you how we can develop this optical holder in an environmental TEM, where light enabled increased reaction rates and site selectivity. And then I kind of switch gear and show you how we were developing a new nanomaterial um, that can enable visualization of in vivo forces. So what does the future hold? Where well, we're moving to ways now where we can use optical excitation plus optimized nanoparticle geometries for product selective catalysis. I think this will be very exciting because there are many reactions where you wind up with multiple products and byproducts, many of which you don't want, and that give rise to a poor atom economy. So we're very excited for product selective catalysis, and then we're also excited to use some of these nanoimaging platforms for early disease detection. And then finally, we don't always just want to be using the most expensive state-of-the-art tools, but we want to develop techniques that are more portable and allow for either point-of-care diagnostics or low-cost imaging technology. So a lot of our work is trying to transform some of these multi-lens devices and uh, bulky transmission electron microscopes into much smaller, compact, and lightweight systems. So with that, I want to make sure I acknowledge our funders of the work spanning the NIH and DOE. Um, and I also want to make sure I acknowledge all of the students and postdocs, both past and present, who made this work possible. Uh, many of them will be outside, and thanks to all of you for your attention. Thank you.